Hi everyone, my name is Kate Morgan and I'm co-chief executive here at Myeloma Patients Europe. Welcome to our webinar today on the basics of medicines pricing in Europe. And this is being held as part of the Horizon Europe Ascertain, um, which I'll tell you a wee bit about in the next few slides. Just to go through the agenda for today, um, so I'm just going to talk you through some quite boring housekeeping rules, and then I'll hand over to our fantastic speaker today, who is Sabina Vogler from the Austrian National Public Health Institute, who will talk us through the basics of drug pricing in Europe. We'll then have um, half an hour moderated Q&A, and we'll close the webinar at half past four. Just to go through the housekeeping rules, um, I know everybody knows these, but we just need to do it at the start um, to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so you should be able to see and hear the presenters, but you unfortunately won't be able to see the other participants. We'll be holding a Q&A at the end of the session, uh, but feel free to post any questions um, that you want answering in the Q&A function, which you can see um, along the bottom of the toolbar in Zoom. Um, if you um, like any of the questions and would like to see them upvoted, um, select like, and that will just signal to me um, that it's a particularly important and relevant question, and I'll make sure I'll ask it on your behalf. As I said, we'll be saving the Q&A until after the presentation, and um, unfortunately, we, um, we'll be... I'll be asking the questions on your behalf, uh, but you won't be able to ask it directly. Um, you can also use the, the chat window, um, again, at the bottom of the Zoom bar, um, to chat with other participants, to share your experiences, and also um, to make any comments that you might have on the content. If you're facing any technical difficulties, um, please let us know in the chat, and a colleague from the MP team will be able to support you um, and hopefully reach, um, reach out to you and fix the problem. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MP website and social media channels after the webinar is finished. And you'll also be able to see it on the Ascertain website and communications channels as well. Just to tell you a little bit about Horizon Europe Ascertain, which this webinar is being held as part of. Ascertain is a four-year project consortium led by Erasmus University Health Policy Department, and it has um, around nine consortium partners from across academia and also from the clinical and patient community and we're aiming to develop new models of pricing and value assessment um, underpinned by three core case studies looking at personalized medicines um, CAR T um, in, in cell and gene therapy and also medical devices and the aim at the end is to create policy tools to promote access to medicines for patients no matter where they live in Europe. This webinar, as I said, it's being held as part of Horizon Europe Ascertain. And throughout the, the, um, the project, MP is providing the patient perspective. And we really want to create a series of educational tools and materials that help demystify some of the more complex areas of pricing, reimbursement, um, and also health economics. Um, the webinar today is primarily designed for uh, patient advocates, but I know we have a range of participants from across the clinical um, and pharmaceutical um, environment, so feel free to participate in discussions. We really want to, um, to demystify drug pricing. We're starting with the basics of drug pricing today um, because it's a really important part of the way drugs are made available in Europe and can determine whether or not a drug is or is not accessible. And I think as, as um, a patient advocate, it's really important to know what the key responsibilities are for drug pricing and also how it ties into other parts of reimbursement and HDA decision making. And I think sometimes it can be quite difficult to understand who is, in, is responsible for decision making and how the, the decision on a new medicine and whether it's available um, is made. So hopefully we can um, demystify some of those misperceptions today and also enable participation in informed discussions on drug pricing. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our um, speaker for today, who, as I said before, is Sabina Vogler. Sabina is head of the pharmacoeconomics department at the Austrian National Public Health Institute, and she's also director of the WHO Collaboration Centre for Pharmaceutical Pricing and Reimbursement Policies. 
Um, Sabina has over 25 years of experience working on pharmaceutical policy and in health economics, so she's really well placed uh, to be speaking to us today about this important topic. Um, thanks very much for joining us today, Sabina. Over to you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's really a pleasure to present here some of the basics of medicines pricing, but you will see, maybe we will leave also the ground of basis and really dig into uh, the area. And I'm thrilled to see that so many people are online. So uh, thank you, Kate, for introducing myself. Uh, to uh, next slide, please. It was already said that uh, uh, I am working at the Austrian National Public Health Institute where I had the pharmacoeconomics department. Maybe just to explain, uh, yeah, that's the right slide, to explain to you the Austrian National Public Health Institute is the Austrian um, Institute to support uh, the policymakers. It's the planning and research institute in Austria. And our role is to do research, capacity building, and support policymakers. And uh, at the Department of Pharmacoeconomics, a WHO collaborating center uh, is uh, located. As you can see here, the WHO collaborating center for pharmaceutical and pricing and reimbursement policies. I would just like to clarify, you see here the disclaimer. Um, it's a collaborating center, meaning that the work that we are doing at the Austrian National Public Health Institute supports WHO. I am not uh, a WHO official. And I'm speaking here as an expert working on Austria, on Europe, and also internationally, and uh, working to get closely with uh, policymakers, but also to specify I'm not a policymaker and also I'm not a negotiator, but uh, I am doing research on that topic, maybe just to give you the background on this. Next slide, please. So I think uh, it's not a surprise. The medicines prices are a major topic. And I was wondering, there's several examples of uh, prices of how unaffordable medicines are. And I decided instead of bringing you examples of individual medicines to show you some data. This data is from the US. Uh, the, my talk will mainly be on Europe, but uh, I think what is um, important to see here is that over the years, the launch price, the price at which the medicine was brought on the market has increased. And this is something we really see with concern while we were talking about the most expensive medicine uh, about more than 10, 12 years ago of um, half a million, then it was 1 million, 2 million, and now we are talking about 3 million. So uh, this is uh, something of really of concern. And next slide, please. Another concern that we have is that uh, the, the new medicines that appear to be very promising and particularly in the area of cancer medicines, but for some, the benefits are not really shown clearly. So we do have uncertainty about the benefits. We do have lack of evidence. I just brought here uh, some studies and you can see the quotes here. And this is of concern for, from a patient perspective, but also when we talk about prices, where we need to find some criteria on some basis to decide which price is justified, this is really of concern. And you see here in the middle that there was one quote in one study that uh, some of the new medicines are neither affordable nor clinical beneficial in comparison 
and of other treatments. And the non-affordability means, and I will go more in detail now, means that this is that patients do not have access to uh, medicines. And this brings me to an overview of what I will be talking uh, within the next uh, 45 minutes. Next slide, please. So my talk will be more or less uh, clustered into three parts. And I know it's, it's quite rich, so you will get a lot of information Maybe we will skip some of the parts for the discussion, but two really key parts are, I want to talk you through and present some of the key concepts that are there to, as said, as the webinar is called, the basics of medicine pricing to show you what is so special about medicines, what has to be considered by regulated, by policymakers? What are the challenges? And who plays which role in pharmaceutical in the pharmaceutical system and with regard to pricing? So that's the first part. The second one is looking at pricing policies for medicines. What are key policies? How can policymakers set the price of a medicine? Uh, which are the key policies that are commonly used in Europe. And finally, and uh, we can also then dig deeper in the discussion, looking at uh, some current um, initiatives to find ways to address potential unaffordability of medicines, address high prices, uh, what can be done. I have to say, this talk uh, is particularly focused on new uh, medicines with high price tags and also from a European perspective. Next slide, please. So what is special about medicines? First of all, medicines are products with specific safety and quality requirements which also means that the regulators need to ensure that uh, these safety and quality requirements are met. To do so, there is a vast body of regulation for different parts for, for instance, clinical trials. What has to be ensured that clinical trials are safe? With regard to marketing authorization, ensuring that only safe, effective, and good quality medicines are allowed to be brought on the market. With regard to distribution and production, good production practice and uh, distribution practice, but also with regard to regulate, regulation, with regard to health professionals, who is allowed to prescribe, to dispense medicines, what has to be taken into consideration. So this is about regulation. And I really want to pick in particular on um, the marketing authorization. So next slide, please. So as I've said, marketing authorization is a regulatory act which the regulator takes to make sure that the medicine that will be then brought on the market is safe, is effective and of good quality. And if this is proven, then it, it's allowed that the medicine can be brought on the market. When we talk about marketing authorization, we do not talk about the price. We do not talk about whether or not the medicine will be included into public funding, into reimbursement. We do not talk about an added therapeutic value over a comparator. It's just the regulatory part, which is the first level. So this is about regulation and marketing authorization is a key regulatory issue. Next slide, please. But in addition, we also need to make sure that the medicines are 
accessible to the patients. It's no use if we have the best safe medicine and it's somewhere on the shelf or cannot be brought to the patients who need them. And this is the responsibility of policymakers. And it's up to them to develop policies that the medicine becomes accessible for the patients. And when I say, and, and you heard me now using the term patient access quite often, there are different components of the patient access. Next slide. And two key components are availability and affordability. In the literature, there's sometimes some other components like acceptability, but uh, we now focus on these two components because they are really key and only if both components are met, then we can talk about patient access. And I use the term patient access because it means that the patient can use it. The more business administration term of market access, well, it's not so important that, it's of course important that the medicine is on the market, but it's not sufficient because it must reach the patient. So the one part is availability. And it means that the medicine must be present at distribution points, like a community pharmacy, in a certain area for the people who need them. So possible limitations of availability are, for instance, medicine shortages, or that a medicine is withdrawn because for quality issues or for some other issues. Availability can also be limited, for instance, if someone is in a remote area and the distance to, for instance, a pharmacy is quite far. So this is availability. And the other component is, and I'm sure you're all aware about that, is affordability. And affordability is defined as the degree to which the medicine is obtainable to the people who need the medicine. And that now it comes at the price, either they, the patients, or the health systems can afford, can pay. So this very general definition takes into consideration that it might either be within a solidarity-based health systems that uh, the, the public health system pays, like it's in the case for medicines with high price tax, or that patients pay either in the form of a co-payment or fully. And if you think, for instance, of, of some countries globally uh, where cancer medicines have to be paid out of pocket, uh, this is something to be considered. So key message, patient access depends on availability as well as on affordability. Next slide. So, how can policymakers now ensure that medicines are affordable? They can do so via policies. And key policies to ensure affordability are pricing policies, on which I will now focus in my talk, as well as funding policies. So whether or not the medicine and to which extent it will be reimbursed by public funds. And I would just like to remind you of the Sustainable Development Goals, where under the goal number three on health and well-being, there is a target, the target 3.8, which says to achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protections, access to quality essential healthcare services, and access to safe, effective quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. So we have here 
the responsibility for governments already in there to ensure this access to medicines. You see here the parts on regulatory issues, safe, effective, and quality, but you also see here the term of affordable. You might wonder what's about essential medicine. This means that it's up to the policymakers to then define and decide with regard to certain criteria, which medicines are essential. So it's not that governments need to pay and fund everything, but to have clear criteria for that. And that's strongly linked to the funding policies. Next slide, please. I said that uh, pricing and reimbursement policies are important ways to ensure affordability of a medicine. And I would like to make clear that these policies are part of the pharmaceutical value chain and they are well embedded and they come off the marketing authorization. So one way to frame, to, to present uh, the, 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 the way, the value chain of a, of a medicine is to distinguish between pre-launch, peri-launch and post-launch phases. The pre-launch phase is before the marketing authorization. So here there is the research and development of the medicine, patenting issues, uh, market manufacturing may start and the company will prepare the dossier for marketing authorization. Then when the marketing authorization has been received, it normally does not mean that the medicine will be brought on the market. It's allowed from a regulatory perspective, but now the affordability and the policy issues come into play. Here normally, as there's also an interest of companies that the medicine is included into public funding, then there is this process of pricing and reimbursement. What do we mean by pricing and reimbursement? Pricing means that the governmental authority sets the price or indirectly sets the price. And there are different ways to do so. And we will look into that later. So remember, it's the government setting the price. And reimbursement means that the a public payer is taking coverage, take covers the the costs of a medicine that is, has been decided to be included into public funding. And this is a decision for each medicine and it takes a certain time. And oh, usually for most medicines, in particular for, for those high cost medicines we are now talking about, um, this has to be first decided before then the company will bring the medicine on the market. And then when there's market entry, then we talk about the post-launch phase and there are certain elements that the, the doctors prescribe, the pharmacist dispense, there's pharmacovigilance, so there might be also some regulatory issues. I now talked about the policies, but when policymakers set certain policies, like the pricing policies, they have to consider the different policy objectives. Next slide, please. So looking at medicines, what are policy objectives that policymakers may aim to achieve? What you see here is a triangle and in a process that was yeah, nearly 20 years ago, um, it was a multi-stakeholder process at EU level. 
it was then uh, kind of decided or committed that for medicines that are publicly funded, policymakers aim to consider at least these three objectives when they set the price and decide on reimbursement. Namely, to ensure that patients have a timely and equitable access to medicines. So the patient perspective, your perspective. But also that pharmaceutical expenditure is controlled. And that pharmaceutical industry is rewarded for innovation. Could you please click? You might say, well, that's not complete. Well, that was the, the kind of a commitment, but of course, uh, there might be other objectives to be considered, like in more with in the off patent market that you say, we want to uh, encourage competition with regard to high prices to say, Fair prices, and of course, fair prices is a challenging discussion, fair from which perspective. Or with regard to the sustainability aspect, it's not just only financial sustainability, but in recent times also thinking about environmental sustainability. So please click. What we see here is, well, when policymakers take their decisions, their policy objectives may be, of course, conflicting, and they have to find uh, a trade-off between them. And as you can also see here, if we just look at the three parts in green, green, uh, blue, they kind of stand for different stakeholders for the patients, the expenditure controlled public payers and industry. And there are different stakeholders. They all have their role, but they have different expectations and policymakers need to manage these expectations and then also decide which policy objectives they want to prioritize and how to have this mix. So next slide, please. Who are these key stakeholders. And I just listed some of them. It's always uh, difficult to find, to, to simplify it. It's, it's of course simplified, um, but I put in the middle the patients. The patients who need medication, who need care. Then we have different stakeholders in the public sector, as well as in the private sector, I acknowledge that some, some of the stakeholders might either be situated in the public sector or in the private sector, also depending on the healthcare system, and they have different roles and responsibilities and also different objectives. This always has to be considered um, when analyzing and trying to understand a pricing system. So, for the public sector, we have the governments at central, regional, local level who are the legislator, but may also take some of the roles uh, like uh, below, for instance, local governments may be also procurers. Then we have the regulator, the marketing authorization agency, usually a medicines agency, the one deciding whether medicine is safe, effective, and of good quality. Then we may have an HDA body, an agency or embedded in some of the other institutions. That's um, an, a body that uh, brings together the evidence as basis for decision-making. I will come to HDA later. Then we have a pricing authority setting the price we have different reimbursement authorities or reimbursement authority deciding will the medicine be publicly funded or not and to which extent. And we have the public payers or sometimes third party payers that reimburse and cover the costs. We have in the public sector hospitals that provide care, uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, some countries have 
public doctors, like in an NHS system, hospital pharmacists, and the universities. That's the public sector. And then we have the private sector. And here, typically, pharmaceutical companies are in the private sector, wholesale companies, community pharmacies are usually private uh, pharmacies with a contract with the public payers to extors. Private doctors, private hospitals. We should also think about financial investors because they can have an impact or have an impact on, on how pharmaceutical companies uh, act. Well, the civil society and media. And as I've said, they have different roles. And with regards to pricing, I'll now try to explain very simplified and, and at the same time, it might be now getting a little bit uh, difficult. Because uh, Next uh, click, please. Because I, yes, thank you. I, I, I really try to simplify it just to make the point. Well, in the middle, it's the patients. And the patients are affected by price setting. Also, the pharmaceutical companies, the wholesale companies, pharmacists, doctors, they are also affected by the price set by those who set the price. So looking at who sets the price, it's normally the pricing authority who sets the price. In some countries, it's an authority that where there is pricing and reimbursement, so they also may set this price. So my point, and, and I will stress it then again, is it's up to the governments normally to set the price, unless they say uh, in certain situations, they leave it to others or they do not do price setting. But of course, it's a question of balance of power. And if you go for a price negotiation, then the one at the other side of the table will also have an impact. So that's why I did this price setting red also a little bit with uh, pharma companies. They are not the price setter, but they can, of course, if they have strong negotiating power, uh, impact uh, how the price will look like. And uh, I have here on the left side, uh, affected by price setting, well, uh, public hospitals, procurers, they might also be affected because there might be a formally negotiated price uh, or, or maximum price and they will work with that on. So next slide, to kind of summarize the responsibilities of the actors with regards to pricing. In principle, it's that the government authorities are responsible for setting the prices through pricing policies, unless they say, no, for certain medicines, we do not set the price uh, or we leave it uh, to certain actors in the supply chain that they do it. On the other hand, and I see there's something missing, so maybe click once again. No? Okay, go back. There should be some text in there. It's not there. There should be the text that uh, the suppliers are in charge, uh, have, of course, some strategic thinking about which price they will have. So, this is not pricing policies because price setting the policies is up to the governments, but they are they can they they think about what can the price be the price that they want to achieve, and this is what I do not call pricing policies but pricing strategies. And in my talk, I will really focus on the policies from the policy perspective. So you cannot, of course, pharma companies have their strategies, but uh, I, it's not up to me to comment on that. And for me, it's really important to make uh, this distinction. 
Um, I put also here the suppliers in the supply chain because it's not just one price, the price changes uh, in the supply chain. There's one price by the pharma company, but then when the medicine is delivered to a, a pharmacy, then there is a markup for the wholesaler. So you have done a wholesale price and then you have the community pharmacy. So what do we mean by price? Next slide, please. Simply speaking, it's the amount paid by the payer. So of pharmaceutical expenditure, there's a value component. And for price comparisons, you have really to be very careful which price you take because you have a price, you can have the price per pack and the different pack sizes across countries. You have price per unit. You can also say for a treatment course, so that's one way. And on the other hand, there are different prices. And I just brought some examples. For instance, you could differentiate between a uh, price per payer. So there's a procurement price, there's a reimbursement price. So even if there's some official price, uh, and then it's split up between the patient pays some co-payments, and the public payer, public payer will be mainly interested in the part here, uh, the payer pays, so the reimbursement price. You can say there's a hospital price or consumer price. As explained on the previous slide, there is um, there are different price types in the supply chain. So ex factory manufacturer price, wholesale price, pharmacy retail price, and, and we will come to that a little bit later, the price per um, publication type, I put it. So we have the official list price, but there are also confidential prices in certain cases. And something which has to be also considered, next slide please, is pricing and reimbursement is a national competence in the EU. So, the marketing authorization is harmonized, but it's then each member state who decides then on the price of the medicine and whether or not to include it into reimbursement. And I put here the national because normally it's a national price, meaning that uh, when the price is regulated, it's the same across the country. We have from non-regulated, price-regulated countries, the situation that prices may differ across countries. The only EU um, regulation that is with regard to pricing and reimbursement of relevance is the so-called transparency directive. And it says that when the member states decide on price and reimbursement, they have to do consider certain timelines. So to take the pricing decision within um, a certain time, 90 days for pricing decision, 90 days for reimbursement decision, or 180 days in general, they have to align with certain criteria, which must be sound and transparent, and the price must be published. I have to say this uh, directive is from the late 1988, and it's published and it was not said which price type was published. So at that time, all these confidential prices, which we see now in this negotiation, nobody thought about them. So this directive is very general. It's generally called transparency directive. It's an EU directive. And please do not uh, mix it up with the transparency resolution from two 2019 of the World Health Assembly. So, um, as, next slide, as prices are set by individual countries, they vary across countries. So, we have quite some differences across the countries. You see it here for some cancer medicines where we did a survey and I have to say the price data 
here are already weighted by purchasing power parities. And still, you see here on the one hand, quite a variation across the countries. And at the same time, it's not necessarily that those countries were of lower income uh, necessarily pay lower prices. But here you see some uh, countries in, in Eastern Europe pay quite high prices. I now move on on the next slide, talking about pricing policies and price regulation. So, so I said it's uh, the responsibility of government authorities to set the price, and that's called price control or price regulation. But it can be decided that uh, the government doesn't take this responsibility and leaves it to the company that they set, that they determine the price, and uh, that's the price how it is, and that's called free pricing. Could you kindly click? If there is price control, there are three ways in general from, from a legislative way, point of view how to do it. Either statutory pricing, meaning the price is set on the basis of a law or an enactment. Price negotiations, where you see here there are the two parties, the, the authority and the company. And yeah, so bargaining power, purchasing power plays a major role or through public procurement or tendering where you have a formal uh, procurement procedure and ask for bids. Next slide, please. And how is the situation in Europe? And we are now looking at the ex-factory prices. Well, what you see here is that most countries have price regulation for so-called reimbursable medicines. Reimbursable medicines are those that are funded by the public patio. And the thinking is, well, we pay for them, um, so we also need to determine them. There is the situation in, in some countries that say, we have price control for all medicines, even for those that are fully paid by the patients. The rationale for that is we want to ensure that even if it's not publicly funded, the patients pay for them, we uh, have some, some control of that. Some countries have a situation where it's for prescription only medicines where there's price control. And I have to say, usually prescription only medicines are reimbursable medicines, more or less. There are two countries with a very specific uh, situation. Um, one is uh, Germany, where it used to be one year, now it's six months, where there is free pricing in the first year. And um, so the company can set the determines the price and the public payers pay uh, the price and only uh, and there is some some price uh, some HDA and and price negotiation but only the 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 determined price comes into play after six months so uh, uh, yeah a very specific situation in in the country where where I am from in Austria there is also some specific situation that uh, we have uh, kind of free pricing, uh, not only for non reversible medicines, but also for inpatient medicines. And when you click on the next slide, you see kind of the impact of that. So here there's a, a price study, which we do on a regular basis. And uh, for medicines in the outpatient sector, so where there is price regulation, Austrian prices are in the upper middle, above the up average, not surprising, we are an affluent country, but for the hospital sector, where there is no price regulation, often you see that the red dots, the Austrian prices are the highest. 
and it confirms quite clearly that price uh, non-price regulation may lead to higher prices and is really kind of a call for policymakers to do price regulation. Next slide. Um, so just to make the point, who pays for the medicines? It's the state uh, and the patients. And for the high cost medicines, click one again. Um, it means that a medicine becomes unaffordable and that was also said by uh, in Norway. And next slide, how to ensure the affordability of medicines. Well, I made the point, it's important to do price regulation, but also to find the most appropriate policy. And I will now present you some key national policies. And the idea is also, which is the criterion to decide um, how, which price is justified. And just want to make clear there are different pricing policies in a country and the policymakers, they may decide for these types of medicines, we want to have this policy and for another, other, another policy. Also because each policy has its uh, limitations and benefits. You might have heard about the policy of external price referencing. This is that the prices of medicines in other countries are taken into consideration. And based on a defined algorithm, the price is then set. The prices and of the same of similar medicines in the same country could also be taken into consideration. That's internal price referencing. And I have it in gray because we will not look into it in further detail because it's more for the off patent medicines. If the added therapeutic value is taken into consideration, then we talk about value-based pricing or some pricing that is based on values with using an HDA. If, let's see if we have time, production costs are normally not taken into consideration in Europe. That would be cost plus. Tendering, again, is a policy more for the off-patent market and what is really playing a major role with regard to high-priced medicines is to, to have some conditionality. So either have some defined health outcomes or some certain conditions where we have conditional pricing and then some managed entry agreements. And now I would walk you through some of the policies, but I see that uh, we are already quite in, in time. So I would just like uh, to consult uh, with uh, Kate. Uh, do I have uh, a little bit more time or shall I stop here and take some questions and continue then? Or how would you like to have it? I think you have 10 more minutes of presentation time. So you, you've got enough time. Okay, then 10 minutes I'll, can be well used maybe to present you some of the policies. Yeah, so the first policy I want to share with you is external price referencing. As said, it's a policy where the prices of a medicine in other countries are taken into consideration. And it's a policy that is used de facto in uh, all EU countries, except for Sweden. And as a non-EU country, UK doesn't use it as well. It's a policy, as you will then hear, that is used, but sometimes used on, uh, as a supplementary way. So other policies then come on top of that. And 
There are different, uh, it's really a policy where the methodology makes a major impact because you can then design it differently. Which countries do I take into the basket? How do I determine the reference price, taking only the lowest countries, lowest price country or some average? How do I deal with the fact that prices are not available for some countries, medicines not marketed? How do I deal with exchange rates and so on? And next slide. So here you see findings, very concise uh, of a study that showed that the methodology has to has a major impact in external price referencing. And as said, each policy has pros and cons, uh, but uh, and, uh, but for external price referencing, it really makes a difference how you design the methodology. And for instance, what you see here is when you look at the country basket, it's not necessarily that when you put uh, have many, many countries in the basket, which is a lot of much more work, uh, that the prices will be lower. It's uh, more important to have a strategic basket. What you also see here is when you consider the discounts of prices in other countries, that this makes an impact. But of course, com confidential discounts are quite difficult to, to assess. This was a simulation, so with some assumption. External price referencing, next slide, please has some disadvantages. And one is it has spillover effects on other countries, meaning that it incentivizes the companies to have a strategic launch. So they will start with launching the medicine in, in a country that typically offers a high price. So. Germany frequently is the first launch country. Austria is often quite second or third. And really designing into pricing strategy, not policy, uh, thinking about uh, how to have this uh, cascade on where to launch, which means that in Mediterranean countries and in particular in Eastern European countries, the same medicine may come on the market two or three years later after it was brought on the market in Germany. So again, you see here, having a European marketing authorization does not guarantee that the medicine will be then actually being launched. Here, just to exemplify that we looked it uh, up for, for a few uh, medicines and it was then shown, you see here that uh, a launch after six months was only in, in very few countries and sometimes it took up to 30, uh, six months or 60 months till the medicine was really then launched in several countries of the EU. So this is external price referencing. Then we come to a pricing policy, which is called value-based pricing. Next slide. And to be quite honest, it's something we are all struggling with to find a good definition for years. So we can have a simple definition saying that the pricing authority, when it sets the price of a medicine, it considers the added therapeutic value. Why added? In comparison to some other medicine. And how is this done? The, with uh, the help of some evaluation, in particular of a so-called health technology assessment. And in European countries, for the high-priced medicines, cancer medicines we are talking about, this is used, again, as an element in many countries. So to have a consideration of the value assessment, but it's not the only criterion and the only policy. As I've said, 
for one medicine, there might be different policies. It's only Sweden, which, if you remember, doesn't have external price referencing, has really a full-fledged value-based pricing system where in an integrated decision process on pricing and reimbursement, the value is taken into consideration. What do I mean by HDA? Next slide, please. HDA is defined as a process that uses explicit methods to determine the value of a medicine or some other health technology. And what is important to understand, it's not a policy per se, but it's a method to inform the policy makers and the decision makers. So with an HDA, you will not set a price, but you will um, provide the evidence to the decision makers. HDA has two components. One is the assessment, which is the collection of the scientific post of the scientific evidence in different areas, like the clinical effectiveness, safety, uh, but there are also some other domains. The other part is the appraisal part, which is you have this evidence collected and then it needs to be considered into the health system, so it has to be appraised. So an HDA process has to consider both parts. And coming back to value-based pricing, next slide. We do have an issue, and you remember what I said at the very beginning about low or limited evidence about some of the medicines also, methods that have not really shown uh, added therapeutic value. And here you have the findings from a study that which said they didn't find a significant association between the cost, the price, and the clinical benefit. So something really, I think, uh, in particular for you to, to consider, how does this link? Um, Click twice. So I go over here. Yeah. I would just like to come to the managed entry agreements. So managed entry agreements is an arrangement between a pharma company and the payer to allow access to a medicine or reimbursement under certain conditions. There are different types of managed entry agreements. There are financial-based managed entry agreements like a flat discount or a, a price volume agreement or some capping, dose capping. Or, and that's maybe the one you're more familiar with and heard about, the so-called performance-based managed entry agreements or outcome-based where a certain positive outcome has to be reached to ensure continuation of the of funding. And what usually managed entry agreements and have in practice is confidentiality. For some, in some countries, you do not even know which medicines are covered by a managed entry agreement. In others, you know the medicines, but you do not know the type. Is it a volume plus volume agreement or some outcome-based agreement? But what all meanwhile in Europe, in all European countries, meanwhile, all managed entry agreements have a so-called confidential price. So how does this work? And this is linked also to external price referencing. So you remember I said external price referencing is frequently used. And Often it starts in the price setting that there is external price referencing. It's the, then determined based on that. You have a benchmark price and click once. But this benchmark price is too high. It's not, un, not affordable. So the government authority, the payer, will sit together with the company and negotiate and some conditions and a part of the agreement is that they will negotiate a confidential discount and um, 
the I and the the, the discounted price is the one which is paid by the public payer, but in the in the registers in the databases where medicines prices must be published, it's the list price which will be published. And for other countries, so you see how the spiral goes. For other countries who will then do external price referencing, they will also refer to the high list price, come to a price that they cannot afford and also will do managed entry agreements. The question is, and it started around 2010, some countries earlier, some later, and it was the idea of, of, of the authorities that this may help to bring access to the patients. But um, it led to a system where the payers are kind of blindfolded because they do not know uh, the real prices. And if you go on the next slide, the question is, well, does do managed entry agreements um, had an impact on improving patient access? And the difficulty is we as researchers, we cannot really provide an answer because everything is confidential. You cannot uh, do studies. You will not receive the price, the confidential price data. I gave here an example from a, the Belgium Public Health Institute who wanted to do a study on that, but had to stop it due to threat of legal action. And um, given these um, difficulties, it's really hard to assess whether or not uh, managed entry agreements have led to improved patient access. My comment is we still see that patient access, affordable patient access in many countries is not there. So probably this instrument did not really work. Um, next slide. The one might argue when you do a performance-based managed entry agreement, at least it helps to collect data, real world data, which you need then, uh, which are really helpful. But we have seen it's a lot of administrative work also for the doctors. And we have seen that often the data are not really collected. And what do you then do if the data are not that good? Can you tell the patient, sorry, did not work? And I brought here a, a study from, from the Netherlands where it was then said that uh, the data could not really be collected. So this hope that managed entry agreements can help to collect the data wasn't totally fulfilled. And uh, with regards to the list prices, next slide, please. There is the problem that the officially published list prices, not surprisingly, will go up because the discount that is granted has, of course, to be accounted in somewhere. So this was also shown in an empirical study. And I would now like, if on the next slide, I had an introductory slide on what are current discussion solutions initiatives, which I will now skip uh, and would go to the uh, slide with my conclusions. Yes, to summarize, so patient access depends on different components, but one is affordability and the price plays an important role whether or not a medicine is affordable. Policymakers, and I think I made this point, they are responsible for developing and implementing the pricing policies and because it's their responsibility to ensure patient access to the medicines which the patients need. You may think that was quite harsh maybe with policymakers. So here there's some kind of, of um, a statement saying because what is reality? 
reality, we all know that governmental authorities are often understaffed and they make like the resources and the capacity to do uh, policy, certain policies, certain policies really uh, need a lot of knowledge, resources, and then governments have to struggle with limited budgets. So medicines cannot be paid at any price. So there's this trade-off. We do have a situation that data are missing, clinical effectiveness data, but of course, uh, price data, the confidential prices. But how can you, as a policymaker, take informed evidence-based decisions if it's not, uh, if, you, if you like information? That's a part I did not uh, touch upon by now, but when looking at the solutions, uh, it's in any case important to have a coordination and a collaboration, both within the country. For instance, currently the marketing authorization um, body, the, the medicines agency, work a little bit distinct from what the pricing authority do. And here, better collaboration would be good. And of course, also, even if pricing and reimbursement is a national competence across countries, and there are some positive examples. But when it comes to medicines with extreme high price tax, and we know all the discussion, it's probably nothing which a single country can solve. So there is the need for more European or even global solutions. And it's something where also it's a responsibility of the policymakers, but where the input of all stakeholders is needed and particularly also the patient perspectives is needed. So I'll stop here. Uh, and um, happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Sabina, for a really comprehensive and interesting presentation covering everything from roles and responsibilities through to, to policy um, and access. I just wanted to kickstart the um, the Q and A uh, section by reminding people that they could post any questions that they have um, in the Q and A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, the the first question I had uh, relates to your to your last point about collaboration, and I think from a patient advocacy perspective, it can be quite difficult to know how we can get involved in pricing policy and um, in discussions around pricing and access. And I was just wondering, from from your perspective, kind of where where do you think patient adv advocates can and should get involved, um, and where can we have the biggest impact in in discussions around pricing, um, both at a European but but most importantly, at a national level. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, where patients can really make a difference is that uh, on specific medicines, they are the experts. The What we currently have is that, uh, and I would say here there is also a lot of learning with uh, governmental authorities, so you also have to bear with them to, to find some processes that uh, patients, and particularly then maybe on, on specific uh, patients with knowledge on specific diseases, are brought in into HDA processes. And depending on how the system is set up, might also be on, on pricing and reimbursement processes. And it does not mean asset, uh, it's the policymakers and they have to take the final decision. So I do not see patients maybe involved in, in, in really then decision uh, with votes, but bringing in their knowledge, and I really see it in, in HDA processes. I, I'm here a little bit struggling and reluctant because I know that HDA in the countries is, as I've said, there are different capacities across uh, Europe, and some countries have very strong HDA processes, um, and they also have, um, have patients involved while other countries 
have do not have a, a really a, an appraisal process need more to build that up where also other stakeholders are would need to be involved but as hda is gaining ground i would say um here there's here I would in particular see the, the role of the patients. Um, the other thing is it's maybe less on, on policy making. Um, I really appreciate that we have this uh, webinar now because I think uh, I, I, I understand the claims of patients that they want access to their medicines. At the same time, I fully also understand why governments are struggling. And if there is an informed dialogue or more of an informed dialogue between the payers, for instance, and the patients, uh, I think that could, and also in public discussion, where, for instance, patients then say, Yes, I need the medicine, but I also can understand why uh, the payer says, well, up to that price, yes, but more it's not possible. I think that could also be helpful. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just move into audience questions now, and we have quite a lot of them, which is really good. Um, the, the first question I wanted um, to ask was around R&D costs. Um, and a participant has asked, what is the relationship between R&D costs and drug prices? And how can we incentivize innovative research without negatively impacting on price? And a related question was around, um, I think in some countries, it seems like industry do set the prices for their medicines, at least the, the initial price. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to get some reflections around that as well. Yeah, R&D costs. To be quite honest, that's one of the areas where we also lack information. So we do not really have a full picture of R&D costs. Um, and there is, um, there is the claim of industry that the high prices are needed to reward R&D, which of course, I can understand, and to a certain part, it's clear. But what is fully forgotten is that payers may risk to pay twice because uh, the, the fundamental research is often done in public universities. So there is already public funding in there. Um, and what would be now needed on the, is a better picture on the real R&D costs, who paid what. I'm aware that the industry responds to that normally by saying it's so difficult with the, to do it per individual medicine uh, because there might be failures out, but still it can be done. But it's, it's again a question of transparency. On the other hand, um, I, I'm, and that was, I had no time to talk about uh, the World Health Assembly Resolution uh, of 2019, where member states committed, de facto nearly all member states, three countries uh, abstained from that, but uh, nearly all countries of the world uh, committed to find ways to uh, publish the net prices and also R&D costs. And so I think one thing is to have a dialogue with industry. Another thing is, and here there's maybe the, the homework also for governments, um, the funding for universities is not with the health sector. It's usually with science and education and the different governmental bodies also uh, would need to maybe collaborate more and uh, and here because the, to have this knowledge uh, and to have this maybe better published. Great, thank you. I think transparency is a, a really, really relevant topic for the whole patient community. It's one that we grapple with. So I think your slides and presentation really went into detail about that and was really useful. Um, the next, uh, questions that I had were around um, the role of the EU in, in pricing. Um, and um, firstly, do you think that the EU should have um, 
kind of more involvement in pricing discussions in setting a price um, and also um, someone is asking around the, the current impact of um, UNETA and, and the potential impact of the EU HTA regulation on um, improving sort of price negotiations on a pan-European level. Uh, yeah, do you have any reflections on those questions? Well, I am, um, and here I'm speaking uh, from, from my perspective uh, as an expert, I'm very much in favor of uh, improved collaboration. And this also means cross-country collaboration, um, where we have some examples by now uh, at the level of, of some of the countries, knowing that this is not an easy process, requires a lot of resources and capacity, but still, and, and maybe something which may not be successful in the very beginning, but may fail after in the, in the first time. But it really increases the, the purchasing power of the, the payers or buyers. They should and also understand we are buyers, so we are not just the price taker, but uh, we are involved in that. If at an EU level, the EU, so now having says, and it wouldn't be the EU saying the commission, but it would be the member states uh, giving the mandate to them, um, that could really make a change. And we have seen uh, what has happened with the COVID vaccines. Yes, we could discuss things that did not work that well. But on the other hand, um, in these difficult times, I mean, it worked that the EU member states said, please negotiate. And we had then ensured that all EU member states had their share of the vaccines, which would have been unthinkable a few years earlier. So, um, of course, it would be challenging from an organization and a legal point of view, but uh, it could really make a difference. The question is, would the member states agree to that or you need the agreement of all? I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, I could imagine which member states would agree. So lower income countries or smaller countries would benefit from that. But the question is, you need the agreement of all. So I, I do not see it in, in the very near future, but uh, you know, during COVID we have seen so many surprises, so you never know. And coming to the health technology reg uh, regulation, um, I think it also shows that uh, we are at least on a way to collaborate more in Europe. It's kind of a puzzle, one part of the puzzle. And I think it the impact it may have is after having solved the difficulties that we will face in implementation, it could, and I, I, I think it will be done a proof that collaboration works. And then you could think from collaboration in HD, maybe moving to another area. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. Collaboration is important. And we've seen um, many advances since um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, a related question to, to international collaboration is related to Beneluxa in similar uh, collaboration um, across Europe. And, the question relates to whether you've seen any impact from, from these collaborations um, on current pricing and also what could be the, the impact in the future? I think the impact is that uh, it gives a proof of concept that uh, collaboration works and um, that uh, the we had the discussion five years ago, it will never work. And now we can say we have some good practice examples. So it's, it, it doesn't have now the, the direct impact on the prices in the other countries, but it shows that it works. It gave an appetite. 
and uh, as you mentioned, Benelux. Uh, um, and it's not just what, what would be important for me to stress, it's not just uh, the joint negotiations. Maybe that's, and it's clear that everyone is looking at what's uh, the outcome of the negotiation, of course, because everyone is interested, did it work for that medicine? But the collaboration is much more than just the negotiation, is that countries uh, have thoughts about how they want uh, maybe change the pricing system, uh, exchange about practices, uh, really exchanges on, on policies, which are not exchanges on, on, on confidential issues, but just to know how other countries do it. And you mentioned Beneluxa, and one could argue that the International Horizon Scanning Initiative is kind of a spin-off of Beneluxa. I mean, it's the Beneluxa countries, uh, supporting IC, this horizon scanning, and some other countries, now in countries. And I think that also shows when countries work together, they have then some ideas how to develop new tools. And yes, IC is new and needs to start to work. But uh, this idea of working together because here you need really a lot of resources uh, to have then a database to look into the pipeline, what is coming um, is something which I find very supportive. And it's also in this, around this term of preparedness. Now we uh, have learned a lot about preparedness, but also with the high priced medicines, we need to know what comes so that uh, given the limited budgets, the policymakers can then decide, okay, I can go for this or that, but also knowing if there's a high priced medicine and then some similar alternatives are also in the pipeline, then you go uh, into a negotiation with a different uh, knowledge than when you're confronted with a purely, purely monopoly product where you think you have to wait for a long time for an alternative. Great. Thank you very much for a comprehensive answer. Um, again, on the theme of international um, processes and, and collaborations and, and impact, uh, we've had a couple of questions around the impact of the US uh, drug pricing process where it isn't as regulated uh, as, in, as it is in Europe. Um, what impact does that have on the EU um, in prices across um, the EU? And um, how, can, how can we minimize that impact? Yeah, I have the feeling um, that the EU is a very closed area. And as the EU is very, or the EU member states are very advanced in their pricing policies, it's when we talk about the, the high priced medicines, not talking about the generic market, but when we talk about the high priced medicines, uh, well, of course, one looks at what is going on across the, the ocean, but it doesn't really have with prices an impact because we say, okay, uh, they now start for uh, a few medicines that they now have uh, the price regulation. So with regard to, to pricing, I wouldn't say that there is an impact. Thank you. Um, just moving into a completely different topic now, um, we've had a couple of questions around rare diseases um, and um, why, why are drugs for rare diseases more expensive than in more common conditions? Um, and should there be different assessment processes um, for, rare, for rare diseases and medicines that address them? Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I think this has to do with uh, the value-based approach that uh, saying um, for certain rare diseases, uh, we consider quite a high value. The question is, do these medicines uh, have, uh, and, and have this value that it is justified in price? And I would also, it also has a little bit to do with the fact that of course, there's an interest 
to have development of medicines in rare diseases. So we have uh, at, at the regulatory level uh, all these incentives um, 20 years ago. And there's this feeling, okay, when you go into rare diseases, um, this is supported and you get high prices. What we also see is that currently there's an orphanization so that um, very small uh, medicines are developed for really very small groups of, of patients and to really individualize and to use this um, as an argument to charge high prices. And uh, I think here, uh, policymakers need, really need to look very closely where where is the benefit for the patients and of course patients need to have these uh, medicines and where are there maybe some business strategies uh, which uh, need to be uh, responded to appropriately. Great, thank you. Um, we only have five minutes left, so I think we can only take um, one more question before we close the, the webinar, but we'll try and ensure um, that after the webinar, we'll, we can answer some of the questions for you in writing. Um, but the, the last question I was going to ask um, from attendees was around indication-based pricing. Um, and someone's asking whether you can have um, different prices across different indications of the same drug and is the drug more expensive when we're talking about different disease areas and how yeah how does it work across different diseases and within the same disease as well well there's a lot of discussion on indication based pricing um some countries started with with uh, indication based pricing but here we also have to differentiate between the official uh, pricing policies, uh, where often it's not indication-based, and when there are some countries really say we have a mixed price, and uh, what is then happening in price negotiations, um, where then also managed entry agreements are concluded, and uh, here then uh, a more an indication-based uh, approach is taken into consideration. In any case, indication-based pricing, and also what does this mean um, in implementation, also then in following up when you then need to generate uh, further real-world data is a lot of uh, discussion and, and some countries are moving more in that direction. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Sabina, for, for taking the time out of your day um, to answer all of our questions and to present such a, a thorough um, overview of, of drug pricing. As I said um, previously, um, we've run out of time to, to ask all of the questions, but I'll collate them and we can see if we can generate some answers in writing. And um, this webinar forms part of a wider educational uh, programme that we have planned through Ascertain. And so um, any feedback that we have um, will go into uh, driving the topics for the next webinars and making sure that we answer all of the questions that arise from the patient community. And um, I think, um, the next webinar that we have planned is on the EU HCA regulation um, in May, and um, we'll, we'll be thinking about more advanced topics around drug pricing. Um, but yeah, um, the, in terms of next steps, um, please follow the MPE website and the Ascertain website um, to keep on top of any developments um, and any educational materials that we have. Um, and so just to close the webinar, again, I'd like to thank you, Sabine, for, for joining us today and taking such a long time out of your day to explain pricing to us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate it. <laughs>